Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Mining in Darba's Digital Diaries, hearing from our industry's disruptors. Today I'm talking to an investor who is no stranger to the mining industry and definitely no stranger to acts of disruption within the investment space. Rick Rule, founder of Rule Investment Media, is going to share his views on investment topics that are exactly this and nothing more, disruptive. Rick, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. I'm particularly honored by this, given that I spoke at the first five or six mining in Davos, probably uh, around the time that you were born. So it's a pleasure to be <laughs> back with you. That's quite incredible. Rick, so um, let's jump into it. I know that you have mentioned that you like to focus on and invest in commodities and geographies that are out of favor. Can you tell me why and share those countries and geographies that currently fit these parameters at present? It has been my experience that natural resource commodities in particular are very cyclical. Uh, and because they're capital intensive, when the price around a commodity moves to the point where it would be economic, it can still take between eight and 10 years to increase supply. Right. So in addition to being uh, deep, the cycles are fairly predictable. Uh, investors uh, are used to different businesses uh, and investors, because of their own time preference, don't react well to cyclicality. When an investor is uh, confronted with a commodity where the global production uh, cost is higher than the sales price of the commodity, which is to say when the industry is in effect self-liquidating, because the investor focuses on the quarter, the investor seldom realizes that either the price of that commodity rises or that commodity is unavailable to humankind. Uh, I have learned myself that focusing on questions where the answer begins with yes, in other words, the, the price has to go up, uh, is better than focusing on circumstances where the question begins with if. The difference between inevitable and eminent uh, and having some patience with a commodity cycle is really, I think, what's uh, the most important reason for my own success. Uh, I like cyclicality. I like volatility. I like certainty. And I've learned, sadly, at age 70, that time preferences, neither yours nor mine, matter. You have to pay <laughs> attention to reality rather than paying attention to what it is that you want. So in context of that very brilliant and in-depth outline, Rick, what commodities and geographies are fitting that description right now? Uh, this will generate a lot of hate for both of us. Uh, carbon, <laughs> carbon is out of favor. Wow. Uh, yep. Yep. The big thinkers in the world seem to believe, uh, at least they tell us, that peak oil demand will occur in 2030 or 2032. This is daft. That's the only way I can describe it. Uh, your attendees would be interested and perhaps horrified to know that the industry has now spent five trillion U.S. dollars over 40 years on alternative energies. And we've reduced the market share of fossil fuels from a high of 82 percent 40 years ago all the way down to 81 percent today. Five trillion dollars has reduced the market share of fossil fuels by one percent. The peak demand for petroleum products, I suspect, will occur in 2060, 2065, as opposed to 2032. What that means is that if you're doing a net present value calculation, your terminal value in 2032 is the same as your starting value. In particular, uh, African countries, since we're talking about Indaba, uh, are endowed with very large, very rich uh, hydrocarbon potentials, uh, and they're be, being encouraged to focus on and develop energy which doesn't work. Uh, so I'm certainly attracted to the oil and gas business. Uh, I'm also attracted, although it's a smaller business, to the coal business, uh, which is hated crisis. even more than oil and gas, which is why I like it. <laughs> The idea that Rick Rule could sit uh, stuffed away in Anacortes, Washington, and compete with the biggest investors and the biggest thinkers in the world uh, is a non-starter. But if none of those big thinkers show up to invest, if they're so driven by their narrative, 
that they don't pay attention to the fact that a billion people on Earth have no access to primary electricity, and coal provides that, I can compete with them. Laura, in a sense, what I'm saying is that even a fat old 70-year-old like my, like me <laughs> can win the 100-meter dash if nobody faster shows up to run. And nobody faster is showing up to run the coal business. Had we had this discussion three years ago, I would have said that the most unloved commodity of all, in fact, the most hated commodity of all, is uranium. It hadn't performed as an investment except for poorly. Uh, and, and it got better than that, really. If I would talk about uranium, people would accuse me of trying to profit from Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Fukushima. <laughs> Now, the same people who criticized me uh, about the uranium thesis, uh, interestingly, are asking me for stock picks. The uh -huh. price of uranium had to go up. It had to go up. Uh, the global fully loaded cost to produce a pound of uranium, I'm not talking about the AISC, but the total cost, including government rent, which the industry lo never likes to talk about, and cost of capital, which they like to talk about less, was about $60 a pound. So the industry globally was making the stuff for 60 US bucks. They were selling it for 40 US bucks. Because they were miners losing $20 a pound, they tried to make it up on volume, which did not work. Yeah. But the price had to go up. It yeah. absolutely had to go up. The alternative was that the lights would go out. The lights were not going to go out. So that thesis has played itself out and it will continue to play itself out. Uh, in terms of locales, uh, this is maybe pandering to the crowd, but there's no place I know that has the wonderful conjunction of demographics, uh, resources, uh, and a changing narrative like Africa. Uh, let's face it, most of the funds flow are, are controlled from outside of Africa. Uh, and investors are oddly uh, unwilling to invest in places that they can't spell. I would suggest that they begin <laughs> to take spelling lessons as opposed to let this ignorance uh, continue to drive them. The perception of Africa around the world is a perception that was generated 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, a continent with no infrastructure, a continent with no human resource capacity. Uh, that perception's very outdated. Uh, if, if you're in the United States, as an example, and you go to Houston, if you wander through the oil companies, oil companies and look at the petroleum engineers, guess what you find? You find Nigerians, <laughs> you find <laughs> Egyptians. The idea that we in the West continue to believe that the human capacity doesn't exist in Africa, I mean, there's no other way to describe it than stupid. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Africa is also a young continent uh, and uh, demand for resources, and in fact, uh, economic growth is all around demographics. Uh, sadly, the US is beginning to look like me, 70 years of age past its prime. Uh, and the antidote to that really truly is Africa. But beyond that, there's endowment. Yeah. Um, the African continent in terms of its proclivity to generate big discoveries, both because of the inherent prospectivity of the terrain, but also uh, because of political, social, and economic constraints that have uh, reduced both exploration and development means that from my own perspective, uh, in terms of terrain, particularly to explore, given my device, given my preference, uh, given being able to find the right people, I'm interested in Central Asia, uh, which is to say the Tethian metallogenic belt, all those places that end in Stan. Uh, <laughs> And Africa, uh, I, it's very difficult to understand why people who uh, are, are, are scientifically driven rather than narrative driven wouldn't focus their risk capital in extractive industries on uh, both Africa and Central Asia. So, Rick, it's interesting. You, you are clearly flying the African flag very highly, which is very refreshing. Um, but as we know, African governments are becoming a lot more educated and they want to maximize on their own minerals. And what we're seeing is that certain jurisdictions like Zimbabwe and the DRC are placing export bans on their critical minerals. From an investor's perspective globally, 
Rick, what is your view on, on, on this activity that governments are catching on to? You took the risk of answering the question, so I'll punish you by answering it. <laughs> uh, I have long believed that the most dangerous government is the one closest to me. Uh, I regard politics it, from the Mencken school, which is to say that you understand politics by examining the root of the world, the word poly, of course, from the Greek for many, and ticks from the English colloquial for small blood-sucking insects. <laughs> um, sadly, uh, Africa has proven itself not to be immune to politics. I would suggest that the worst colonial legacy that Africa suffers is big government. Uh, African countries are right to determine their policy outlooks. I'm just embarrassed to watch them follow the lead that the Caucasian colonialists left them. The neo-colonialists, of course, the black kleptocrats who <laughs> disgrace so many of their countries. The idea that a country should invest money in the part of the value chain where they have no durable competitive advantage when society's highest and best use of the money would probably be to sponsor geological surveys and sell rather than give away the data or drill water wells in villages or at least allow me to drill water wells in villages without charging me a permit to generate water which is given to the community uh, from the point of view of a foreign investor it makes much more sense to the extent that African governments became more investor friendly than Western governments, they wouldn't have to ask me to beneficiate because I would beneficiate there. If there were reliable power, if there were fiscal stability, if there were better rule of law that exists in other places that I invest, including better rule of law than the People's Republic of California, where I originally hailed from, I would be happy to invest in Africa to the extent that, as an example, there was access, uh, fiscal stability, and the rule of law. Uh, an old man like myself would love to invest in stable things like hydroelectric power in Congo. Mm. You wouldn't need to require me to do that. If you allowed me to do it, if you allowed me to do it with a level playing field, particularly if you were competitive with other jurisdictions in the world, given African demographics, given the exploding middle class, given the human capacity in Africa, if only African governments were, African countries were better governed than Western countries. And by the way, that's a very low bar. It's a really, really, really low bar. There wouldn't be the need uh, to put controls on the export of unfinished materials. If you could permit uh, a smelter, uh, if you could permit and were allowed to operate hydroelectric facilities, if you uh, uh, allowed us uh, a level playing field with regards to fabricating fertilizer from African potash, African phosphate, and African natural gas for distribution to African farmers, Believe me, Laura, we'd be on it like white on rice. <laughs> yeah, Rick, um, you just leave me with, with a lot to think about, but we're, we're on the topic of governments and I, and I want to explore something else that, that connects to government because you've also mentioned to me that you have an interest in private financing of governmental participation in extractive industries. Now, in light of everything you've said, to me, this might be unusual and maybe disruptive. So wh why are you particularly interested in this? Countries around the world, uh, and, and to some extent societies around the world, have uh, an interest in increasing domestic participation in all of their industries. Uh, some of those same countries don't have access to capital. Uh, now, occasionally, they solve that conundrum by stealing the wealth. Stealing the wealth precludes their ability to generate more wealth because they consume which is that which is stolen rather than reinvest it. I believe that the opportunity exists for private parties to finance government participation in extractive industries. 
One example would be Ghana, which is uh, exploring uh, in the face of extraordinary fiscal constraints, uh, how to utilize their royalty business. My suspicion is that Ghana would be well advised to take their royalty package public in some way, shape or form. Royalties, even in jurisdictions that are often wrongly perceived as being riskier, uh, have lower cost of capital than any other form of extractive industry. The idea that a, as an example, a, a Ghanaian royalty package could trade on public markets at, at uh, two times net present value, uh, reinvesting some of the proceeds uh, in exploration or development in Ghana, for profit, by the way, uh, while continuing to enjoy the dividend stream, but, but sharing it with investors who paid retail to participate in it, makes a lot of sense. Uh, countries also want to participate to the upside in minerals pricing, uh, you know, to the extent that a commodity price goes up, they want to benefit. Private investors too, that's called a stream. To the extent that uh, governments negotiated in, uh, in concession agreements, participation to the upside on commodity prices for part of the commodity stream, uh, of the mine uh, without unduly burdening the mine at current prices, but rather negotiated an upside participation, uh, that's called a stream. If you look at the market success as an example of wheat and precious, or if you look at the success of some of the private companies, I'm thinking of Orion uh, or Appian in streams, to the extent that uh, frontier market and emerging market countries that controlled developments and wanted to participate in the upside uh, could easily uh, structure in streams and bring in private capital, utilizing that private capital to do some of the mine finance uh, or, or oil and gas finance around uh, the country. Uh, this is fairly simple stuff, uh, and it's a fairly simple circumstance where everyone, everyone, wins. Now, it's important to understand that this involves investment, not consumption. And I think that many governments feel that they're in the consumption business, not in the investment business. <laughs> uh, certainly, that's something that uh, emerging and frontier markets have been taught by development markets, uh, which is to say that governments really, uh, well, they don't invest, they spend. And this whole this whole paradigm that I'm suggesting uh, involves governments having the wisdom to invest for their future of their people uh, rather than attempting to stay in power by pandering uh, to groups that want subsidies beginning last week. The third area, I guess, is to the extent that uh, frontier market nations, I'm thinking now of Indonesia as an example, uh, wanted a, a larger stake in Grassberg but they didn't have the ability to finance those investments from their current budget because they had other things to do with it. Uh, if they could partner that uh, or borrow it under some sort of circumstances with private actors, uh, there are a whole bunch of us, uh, given fiscal stability, given the rule of law, uh, given attractive returns on capital employed, that would love to participate in that. Uh, and I mean, really, truly love to participate in that. Uh, leadership in this, I think, has begun to be uh, established by some of the indigenous people in North Americas, uh, depending on how they choose to be called tribes or bands, uh, where they have determined that they would like to participate in extractive industry development on their ancestral lands, but they didn't as societies have sufficient capital savings to do that. Increasingly, what you're seeing is partnership between indigenous communities and investors, uh, where the private capital and the inherent right and access uh, of the indigenous peoples is married to the benefit of both. I think there's tremendous, tremendous scope for this to the extent, as an example, that Congo 
the Democratic Republic of the Congo regrets the contracts that they entered into 30 years ago when copper prices were lower. And Congo, in fairness, was uh, engaged in a civil war, which constrained investments. The fiscal terms that were negotiated 30 years ago were generous, frankly, given the circumstance in the DRC 30 years ago. They're no longer generous to the extent that the Congo wanted to renegotiate that and buy into some of those deposits, buy mm -hmm. into some of the infrastructure. Uh, and, and didn't have the money. My suspicion is that if there were uh, rules around fiscal stability, uh, if, if there was a commitment on the part of the Congo to develop reliable power and reliable rail, that the inherent right of the Congolese people to participate in that extractive uh, I I industry development would be easily financeable to the benefit both uh, of the citizenry of the DRC and also to the benefit of the ex investors. What you say in principle makes so much sense, but the nuances of Africa don't make it quite that simple, Rick, right? I wouldn't constrain that to Africa. Uh, as Fair I enough. say to me, the, the government that's the most dangerous is the one closest to me. When I look at the risk, of, well, I shouldn't say risk adjustment. When I look at the return on capital employed, that I have enjoyed uh, in some traditionally challenged places, South Sudan, Congo, um, as an example, uh, yeah. just to, to name two, they've been extraordinary because I've been willing to take front end risk uh, and more extraordinary perhaps because of the endowment. Uh, when I look at places where I've been, where I've suffered the worst from political risk, those are jurisdictions that aren't conventionally regarded as being risky. I'm thinking now the province of British Columbia in Canada, yeah. uh, which initiated confiscatory taxes on foreign owners of real estate, or uh, the state I hail from, the People's Republic of California, uh, where we made a discovery, sadly, about 11K on the wrong side of the California-Nevada line. <laughs> and try as we might, we couldn't drag the deposit into Nevada. Uh, the consequence of which was that we spent uh, 13 years in needless oh. permitting hassles. If you think on a net present value basis uh, about the destruction of value for cash flow delayed 13 years, particularly the then prevailing interest rates, what you'll see is that the government of California uh, cost the owners of that discovery something like $600 million in net present value. And then they tell me Congo's risky. <laughs> when you put it in context like that, then Africa doesn't seem so bad. Rick, um, I'm, I'm thinking back to the beginning of our interview and you were talking about coal and fossil fuels. And what comes to mind is the PGM sector because prices are really low. Uh, companies are restructuring already, but it's needed for this new hydrogen economy. What is going on and is now, in your opinion, Rick, the time to be investing in PGMs? I think what's happening in PGM right now is that a big producer, uh, Russia, needs money. I saw this in the early 90s uh, when political elites need money. Uh, they sell whatever they have to raise cash, irrespective of what the replacement cost might be. You're seeing this in a wide variety of commodities. The Russians, for fairly obvious money, obvious reasons, need money. And they're absolutely emptying the cupboards uh, wholesale at whatever price they can. Um, this makes perfect sense. It's a wonderful scenario looking forward for two reasons. The, the prices are unrealistically depressed at the same time that the Russians aren't making sustaining capital investments. So they won't be able to maintain their production in four years or five years. For people who have the ability to look at these simple facts and think in three-year terms, four-year terms, five-year terms, uh, it, it is very, very attractive. I'm attracted to the whole PGM suite. Now, when you're looking at PGM, uh, uh, and I'm not going to pander to the audience now, if you look at the political and social constraints around PGM production uh, in South Africa and Zimbabwe, you're challenged. Uh, you have a circumstance where certain state actors are suggesting to the mining industry that they shouldn't own the assets. That makes capital investment very difficult. So what happens in South Africa and Zimbabwe is that you substitute labor for capital. Uh, you have a circumstance now where the miners' wages have to go up 
but they can't because the mines are losing money. Yeah. <laughs> and there isn't the incentive to substitute capital for labor uh, because some of these geniuses uh, have <laughs> told the industry that they can put in all the capital they want and the geniuses will steal it. PGMs are very interesting in the sense that from a real viewpoint, they came from Russia, they come from South Africa, and they come from Zimbabwe. Uh, all due respect to the ascent of Africa, politics in Africa haven't ascended very much at all. And what that means is that while the future for demand around PGMs is absolutely assured, not just for platinum, by the way, uh, I, I think the fuel cell is something that will do something for us 20 years from now, mm -hmm. but rather uh, for the real use currently, uh, which is an auto catalyst. Uh, demand is assured at the same time that supply uh, rests on very, very, very shaky grounds. Uh, so for me, I may be wrong, but the next five or six years looks extraordinarily bright for platinum. What could go wrong? Well, the geological endowments uh, are in places where the politics are in flux. Yeah. Uh, Zimbabwe hasn't decided what Zimbabwe is going to look like five years from now. They've also <laughs> made it very clear that they're not completely certain what role I should play in that, if any. When I say I, I'm saying parenthetically, Caucasian yes. foreign capitalists. And the same discussion is taking place in South Africa. Well, the South African government has been uh, fairly forthcoming about the need for capital investments. They've deliberately precluded those same investments. And Russia, of course, is Russia. Uh, Russia is busy prosecuting a war. So they have other things to do with their sustaining capital investments at the same time that they're emptying the cupboard uh, uh, of all of their endowment. So it's a, it's a really interesting conundrum. I'm, I'm taking the chance. I'm, I, I believe uh, that the related materials around platinum and palladium, particularly nickel, uh, are oversold both by Russian dis, dis hoarding and okay. also by laterite nickel production in Mindanao and the Philippines, which I think is unsustainable for a bunch of reasons, including environmental reasons. Uh, I think that the ultra mafic complex may be the uranium uh, five years from now. I wonder uh, if I'll be allowed to participate in it. I'm financing most of my own uh, ultra mafic exploration in Brazil, uh, a place that uh, has the same sort of reputation as Africa, but at least right now has decided that old fat white guys are welcome. <laughs> uh, Rick, such interesting views. Look, I want to touch on, on one more subject today, if I may, and that is around exploration. Uh, exploration is the underlying requirement for the future of mining, and it's so it, it's, it's, it's not happening in Africa right now. I, I, Maybe you know why, I can't quite figure out why there's such limited uh, exploration. What is needed? How do we disrupt the situation? Rick, how do we increase exploration in Africa? I've explored in Africa for a very long time uh, and had, well, by my standards, almost fictionally good outcomes. Uh, the hamper on my experience in Africa has been that the exploration in Africa was driven from outside Africa. Uh, what is needed is a new generation uh, of African leaders. There needs to be an African Robert Friedland. Uh, there needs oh, to be wow. an African yeah. Doug Kerwin. There needs to be an African family uh, like the Lundines. Uh, we, particularly me at age 70, uh, I'm not going to go to Congo every three months anymore. I'm not going to do yeah. it. I can't do it. Uh, I didn't have to go to Congo when Adolf Lundin went to Congo. I didn't have to go to Congo when Robert Friedland went to Congo. Uh, Adolf Lundin, rest in peace, is now dead, as is his son, Lucas. Uh, Robert Friedland is 72, 73, he's got his hands full. <laughs> there needs to be a generation of driven, educated entrepreneur uh, that is African. It's okay if it's Caucasian African, but if you look at the demographics of Africa, where 99% of the population is African and 1% is Caucasian, the probability is that the Lundin needs to be African. Yeah, uh, that's what I would like to see. I, I, I don't. I also think that there need to be there needs to be the development of capital markets in Africa. The idea 
that the ANC hasn't, in the time that they've been ex in existence, looked at the capital markets in the United States, looked at the capital markets in Canada, looked at the capital markets uh, in Australia, and allowed, not forced, allowed junior capital markets to develop in South Africa is absolutely mind boggling to me. I mean, I have a very, very, very low bar for government stupidity, but it's always <laughs> exceeded. <Yeah. laughs> well, Rick, uh, uh, the, the theme of this video is about disruption and you have met that theme with absolute perfection. Uh, thank you for your frankness and true honesty and transparency about what you think about Africa commodities and what Africa really needs. I've, I've enjoyed listening to you and uh, I'm sure our audience is going to as well. Listen, I'm hugely bullish on Africa, hugely bullish on Africa. Uh, the emerging middle class, the demographics, the difference in uh, capacity uh, in Africa now compared to the internal capabilities of African society in the early 80s when I began to enjoy success in Africa is literally night and day, literally night and day. I wish at age 70 that I was middle aged as opposed to old because I'd love to see what happens in Africa in the next 70 years and I'd love to be a small part of it, a beneficiary. Enjoyed your views, Rick. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you.